We're uh, in a series looking at Mark's gospel. We're kind of journeying through Mark, uh, and it's called The Irresistible Jesus. And we're discovering just how irresistible Jesus is uh, over the weeks. And we're discovering that he has an irresistible power, an irresistible um, uh, authority. He is an irresistible healer. And he has an irresistible life as well. Uh, and we're, that's what we're looking at today, the irresistible life of Jesus. I don't know if you've uh, ever felt like you've had to wait a long time to receive something or, f- or to wait for a long time for some kind of breakthrough in your life or, uh, or some, some sort of development that you've been hoping for for a long time and it feels like it's not coming. Uh, for me, it was, uh, it, was a, it was a long time before uh, we were able to move from, uh, into ordained ministry so uh, Fuzz and I had been working for a church uh, for about six years um, in South East London, down in Peckham, and we really loved it, and we felt that God had given us a call uh, on our lives, and we thought, this is what we want to do with our lives. We want to be part of a local church. We want to see people coming to know Jesus, released into a new life uh, in him, and then discover what they were made for what gifts God has given them, and get using them. We felt like God had given us a, a, a call to, to see that happen. But then, you know, the Church of England is, a, is, a, is kind of a funny thing. Uh, and it's kind of like um, uh, Heinz uh, ketchup. You've got to kind of, you know where, you've, where you pour it, you've got to hold it up for a long time before anything comes out. You have to wait for a long time before the good stuff comes from the Church of England. Um, and uh, so it was, it, was, it was at least maybe two years um, extra of waiting before, uh, before we... I'm just going to switch over to this mic. It was a good two years um, after we'd um, decided that we've, we felt God was calling us into the Church of England before I was able to go to um, theological college to get trained up and do a theology degree. And then that's a three-year process. And, um, and then, we, then I was ordained to St. Paul's here um, three and a half years ago. And it, it kind of feels like now we're, we're ready to, to be where God wants us to be. And so in January, we're going to church plant from here after this great period of learning and training um, by you under Rick's leadership in this local form of church that we long to see um, in the Isle of Dogs. Uh, but again, we're in that waiting phase. We're waiting again right now. We're not quite sure where we're going to live. Um, we, we, we trust that God's got a place, but we don't know exactly where we're going to live. Uh, and so we're, we're kind of waiting and we're kind of praying. We're sort of also saying, God, why, is it, why does it feel sometimes like it takes so long? And, and it may well be that there are things that you've been waiting for for a long time. And you, and you feel as if you, you haven't got to that point where you want to be. Um, in life or maybe in your relationship with God or maybe in certain aspects of, of, of your life maybe uh, there's you know you're kind of living with <clears throat> with with illness or uh, with with with, with um, poor health or and you're kind of waiting and looking for healing uh, for wholeness I mean uh, we need to pray for Nita and Nathan for a place for them. They've been waiting to move into Shad, uh, the Shadwell area. And, and you know, they're praying for a place to move into. And, it, and they're in that waiting phase. And it's not, it's not an easy place. And they're kind of an amazing example of faith in the waiting. Um, but if any of us are feeling like we resonate with that sense of sometimes needing to wait and we're asking and we're getting frustrated and we're wondering what God is up to, then this passage today that we just read, that Rick read to us, should be a massive encouragement. And I'd love us to just kind of have our Bibles open and really work through this passage together because it, it's, an, it's an amazing story of the way in which sometimes you have to wait longer than you want to, but with God, you always get more than you even bargained for more than you were asking for in the first place, because that is um, the way that God is. So let me pray for us as we begin um, looking at this passage. Father, we thank you for uh, your love. We thank you for your purposes and plans for every single one of us, for every single person here today. Thank you that you have a good and perfect plan for their life. Thank you. Lord Jesus, that you have an irresistible life. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you would bring this word alive for us today. That you might give us patience in the waiting. 
that we might receive even more than we can ask or imagine. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, Jesus has been uh, over um, on the kind of on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, the, the Lake of Galilee. He's been over there to do ministry. Uh, and he's had a pretty eventful time. Uh, and now he's decided to return back to Capernaum, which is uh, on the western side of the Sea of Galilee, and is kind of his base for, for ministry. Um, and, and has been for some time and will be for some time uh, onwards. So he's heading back across the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum. And so that's where we pick it up in verse 21 of, of chapter 5 of Mark. And so when Jesus again crosses over back to Capernaum, uh, to the other side of the lake, a large crowd of people gathered around him. And as he's there uh, and he's being greeted by this large crowd, into this um, big kind of melee of people arrives a key leader in the life of the community. He's a synagogue leader called Jairus. The synagogue was a place that, 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 that Jesus spent a lot of time. Sometimes it was a place where, where healings happened. Sometimes it was a place where we, we see his irresistible life. Um, and sometimes it was a place of opposition where people turned against him and where they, they, they accused him of acting in a way that was not even moral because he was healing people on the Sabbath, which was a day of rest, and he shouldn't be doing that. So this is a, this is a leader from the community who, uh, who we don't know which side of the, uh, of, the, of the boundary marker Jairus falls. We don't know whether he was somebody who was pro-Jesus because he saw that this was a, 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 a man of God who was doing great things. Or we don't know if he was actually a skeptic, somebody who, who felt really kind of rubbed up the wrong way by Jesus and by his ministry. But whatever he was before, something has happened. Something has happened to expose a real need in his life. And so he comes to Jesus from that point of need. So Jairus, this is the name of the, of the leader, he, he comes and he arrives and, and he comes before Jesus and he falls at his feet. This was a leader in the community. And Jesus is a itinerant, a homeless teacher, a rabbi that many people are following, but you know, not a kind of a, a pillar of the community in any sense. And yet here is a leader, Jairus, of the synagogue, a religious leader, no less. And he has a need exposed in his life. And so he comes to Jesus and he falls at his feet. He falls at his feet and he explains what the problem is. He says, my little daughter is dying. She's not just poorly, she is actually dying. It's, it's an emergency. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. Jairus believes that Jesus has certain powers that will be able to release the suffering that his daughter is experiencing. He believes that, that, that Jesus can, can actually heal his daughter, even though she is dying. We don't know what the illness was, but she is dying. So Jesus responds, and of course he goes immediately. In verse 24, Jesus went with him. And so as they're going to Jairus' house to, to see the condition of his daughter, there's the large crowd that comes with him because they want to know what's going to happen. The crowds always follow Jesus when they hear there's a miracle that's in the offing or they hear that there's some kind of new amazing demonstration of, of power that Jesus is going to do. They want to see it. They, 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 you know, they're... They're, uh, they're hungry for it. It's like following celebrities. It's, it's, this is a big thing for the community. And so this large crowd that's, that's gathered follows Jesus. And, and they're all gathered around him because they want to see what happens when they get to Jairus' house. And in amongst that crowd, there's a woman. And, the, and Mark describes her condition in verse 25. We're told that she had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She's experienced this ongoing um, huge pain and discomfort. And it's, it's been something that has actually prevented her from being part of the wider community. Because she was experiencing this ongoing bleeding, within that Jewish community of, of that time, she wouldn't have been able to be um, part of the, you know, the society more widely. Because she would have been ceremonially unclean. So she, she was sort of 
set apart, she was ostracized from the wider community because of this terrible condition that she'd experienced. Not only that, but she, in, in pouring her, the, all the resources that she had, the money that she had, into trying to find a cure, she'd actually made herself worse. Verse 26, she'd suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and spent all that she had. It actually got worse as she, as she tried to get um, her, her condition treated. But she hears about Jesus. She hears that he's in the area, just as Jairus had done. And so she thinks he can help. If I just touch his clothes, he doesn't even have to know about it. I can see that he's a man in a hurry. I can see that there's this other need that he needs to attend to. I know that he hasn't got time to give his attention to me, but if I even just touch him, it might, it might make a difference. It might help me. And so she does. She reaches out and she touches Jesus. And in verse 29, the most amazing thing happens. Immediately, her bleeding stopped. And she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. And what does she do? Does she say, hallelujah, praise the Lord, I'm healed. Join me in my celebration. No, she doesn't do that. She's freed from her suffering and she knows that. But she tries to slink away because she's still feeling the, 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 the social stigma of, of the condition that she's had for so much of her life. And so she thinks, I just need to absorb this fact. This is amazing. I feel different. I know that I've experienced healing. Um, I need to go away now and, and work out what's happened. And so she, she, she's kind of disappearing, melting back into this crowd that are crowding around Jesus, pressing in on him. She's just one of the many people that are crowding around Jesus and touching him. And yet, Jesus understands that something has happened. At once, in verse 30, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. So Jesus and understands that it's not just that there's a whole bunch of people that are kind of crowding around and jostling. There was one person amongst that crowd that came to him with a particular need, a need for healing. And when they touched him, they received healing and power went out from him. And it's that fact that makes Jesus stop, even though he's you know, the, the blue lights are flashing and he's in an emergency. He's got to get to Jairus' house. He stops and he turns around and he says, who touched my clothes? Somebody here touched me, not just kind of bumping into me, jostling around, um, pressing in, trying to follow as close as they could to be as near the action. No, somebody here touched me differently. Somebody touched me here in hope, in desperation, looking for healing, looking for help. I need to know who it was. Why does he need to know who, who it was? He knows that power has gone out from him. He knows that she has been healed. And yet, he delays his emergency. He stops and he waits and he insists that he find out who that person was. And so as he waits and looks around, the, the woman realizes actually she's not going to just get away with it this easily, that she's going to have to have a, some kind of a conversation with the one that has healed her. And so in verse 33, the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him the whole truth. Why is she fearful? She's just been healed. I think she's fearful because she's received some healing in her body, but she doesn't feel like, as I said a few moments ago, she still feels like that, that she needs to hide herself away from the society because of what she's experienced in her life. And so to be exposed like this in this moment of healing has kind of it literally uh, thrown everything up in the air for her. She, she's now... She's trembling because she doesn't know what to do with herself. 
She's trembling with this, this fear of being exposed before um, the community and before Jesus. But she says everything uh, that, that has happened. She tells him why she came and touched him. It's because she'd been um, experiencing this terrible condition and she felt that if she just touched his clothes, she'd be healed. And then Jesus says, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Jesus needed to have an encounter with the woman. It wasn't enough for the woman to have an encounter with Jesus so that she would touch him and then receive his power. For her to really experience what Jesus wanted her to have, he needed to actually encounter her. And and I would put it to you that the the kind of faith that she had initially in Jesus was was a little bit of a a superstitious faith. Yes, she believed that, that Jesus was powerful, that he had some sort of authority in him, but she she believed that she could just touch his clothes. So that, you know, it's almost kind of like you know, the relics and stuff of medieval Christianity. Um, if, if, you, if you touched a certain relic that came from you know, Jesus, uh, the cross or from a saint, that you would, you'd be healed by the power of the, something in that relic. And, and it's like the woman had that kind of faith. She thought, there there's must be power in the clothes even of Jesus. And so Jesus needs to move her on from that kind of uh, sort of low level faith to a faith that really frees her. She'd experienced free, um, freedom from her suffering, her physical suffering, but Jesus wanted to give her more than that. And so he needed to move her from this kind of superstitious faith into a faith in him. And so when she confesses, it's almost like it's that act of opening up of saying, okay, it was me. I needed you. I, I, needed to, I needed to be healed. It's in that very experience that Jesus can give her what she really deep down needs. And what she needs is peace. What she needs is to, to know God's peace in the, the whole of her life. Not just, you know, freedom from this, this debilitating illness that she's experienced for so long, but a, a deeper peace than, than that. A peace that would, that would cover her whole life. And because Jesus has been able to engage with her, find out what her needs are, he's able to say to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Not not you know touching my garment not touching the the the, the hem of of my of my robe it's not that that healed you it's your faith in me it's your faith in 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 what you've seen of me maybe you don't understand fully who i am but but you but your faith in me has healed you and i want to give you more than just freedom from suffering great that that is I want to give you peace. And so Jesus says, go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Go and live a different way, free from feeling that you need to hide away, uh, be shut off from the rest of of, of your fellow um, neighbours. Go and live a life of peace. Go and let that life of peace kind of overflow into the world around you because you're living by faith now. Your faith has healed you. Now, this encounter must have delayed him by a certain degree. Because while Jesus was still speaking in verse 35, some people come from the house of Jairus and they say, it's too late. Your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. At which point we think, that's outrageous. Jesus delayed, kind of um, tarried on the way to Jairus' house for somebody who had a chronic illness but was not dying. And as a result, somebody has died that could have been saved if he'd got there sooner. You know, if that was, if that was a GP or a doctor in an emergency setting, 
they would be sued for malpractice, wouldn't they? they have to, you have to weigh up these things. There's somebody with a chronic condition, and there's somebody who's dying. Who do you go to? You go to the person that's dying. But Jesus, knowing that fact, even knowing that, waited, stayed, remained engaged with this woman. And as a result, he was too late, and Jairus' daughter had died. But Jesus seems to be comfortable with this delay. It's almost as if he 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 knew it was going to happen, and it it was necessary because he overhears what they've been saying in verse thirty six. Jesus tells them, "Don't be afraid. Just believe. Don't be afraid. Just believe." And so we see that there, there there's something going on here with faith and fear, and fear being the opposite of faith so that Jesus says don't be afraid don't be full of fear about what you see and what you hear and and the way things seem to be just believe believe in me believe in what you've asked me to do it's not too late so they carry on and 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 by the time they get to Jairus's house they they see that um the 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 mourning family are already sort of into that process of grieving. Uh, and so there's this commotion and there's this wailing and people are crying and, and it's, you know, it's a scene of chaos and, and just horror because of what's happened to this, this young girl. And Jesus arrives and he goes in and he says to them, why all this commotion and wailing? Didn't you ask me to come? The child is not dead, but asleep. Now, the family and friends laugh at Jesus. And it's a kind of grief-laden, bitter laughter that comes from knowing, actually, that Jesus is wrong. That she's dead. There's no two ways about it. She really is dead. And it's the kind of you know, bitter laughter that, that fails to understand that, that, that Jesus is still in control. That Jesus still knows what he's doing. Because as far as Jesus is concerned, she is only asleep. She is dead, but she's, in his eyes, and because of what he intends to do, he considers her to be only sleeping. And so as he goes in... Um, he, that's the way he treats her. Notice the way that Jesus, Jesus sends them all out. Let's, let's get a little bit of peace and quiet because it's never nice waking up to a chaos and I can tell you that with um, four young boys. Uh, it's not nice waking up to the kind of like, oh, yeah, Lord, why can we watch TV? Um, and that kind of commotion and wailing. Um, and I'm sure that would have been the case for this young girl as well. So you, do, you don't want that kind of thing. Um, and so he's just in there. And a few of his disciples, that core group, remain in the room. And Jesus sits down by this, the the, the body of this young girl. And he treats her just the way a parent would treat a child that has been sleeping and needs to wake up. He takes her by the hand. And he says, little girl, I say to you, get up. That phrase, little girl, Talitha, is, a, is an affectionate term. It's what, it's what a parent would use for, for, their, for their child that they love and they know and they see around. It's, the, it's, the, it's not a term of, uh, of, you know, that you use for, for someone you don't know. It's a term of intimacy that you only use for your own children. And Jesus treats her like that. And immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. And at this they were completely astonished. So Jesus treats death as if it's only sleep. How is he able to do that? 
How is he able to give this girl her life back? Here's a... um, Here's the way that C.S. Lewis describes this kind of miracle in the gospel. He, he talks about two different kinds of miracles. And, uh, and some miracles he, he would put into this category of miracles of the old nature. So miracles that, uh, that, um, that if you accept that Jesus is the son of God, is God come in human form, then by extension you would understand that Jesus could do these things. So, um, for example, uh, the, the stilling of the storm. Well, God is in control of the storms. He's the creator and the sustainer of the storms. And so he can do that kind of thing. He can still the storm. But this is not that kind of miracle. This is a miracle of the new nature. Raising somebody from death differs from that kind of thing. This is a miracle of the new creation. This is where time works backwards and something that's just been dead comes alive again. It's almost as if time is working backwards and those processes of of decay and and, and things falling apart are are working in the other direction and things are being, being put back together again and things are being brought back to life. That is what this woman is experiencing, this girl is experiencing. And it's because Jesus has power even over death. He has power over death. He's able to reach down into death and raise this girl back to life. And it was because Jairus had to wait longer that he was able to see and experience the life that Jesus really had for him, for his daughter, for every single one that was there. It's that same waiting, the waiting of of the woman and the waiting of Jairus. Waiting, hoping for something, but then receiving so much more. And ultimately, it's because Jesus was willing to experience separation from his father on the cross and the death that he died there in our place. And yet, the power of his indestructible life that broke through death into new life in his resurrection, it's because of that that when we wait, we can wait expectantly, knowing that God will give us more than we could ask or imagine. And in a moment, Rick's going to lead us in uh, communion as we focus our thoughts on our Saviour, the King, Jesus the one with an irresistible life. And yet that life which was poured out to death so that we needn't experience the ultimate separation ourselves, so that we might experience life in all its fullness. We might be freed from our suffering and we might know peace in our lives. Amen.